Thank you again for joining today's discussion on disaster planning, resilience, recovery, and social equity in the era of climate change. Rob, I'm going to turn it over to you now to introduce our panelists and lead the discussion. Hey, thanks, Brian. This is Rob Verchick. I'm glad to see everybody. It looks like uh, there's a nice list of folks I can see, including some former colleagues and students, so welcome. Today I'm going to introduce CPR's new report on disaster policy, which was called uh, From Surviving to Thriving. I'll then discuss uh, some of the key topics in that report with two special guests, and I'm going to introduce them just very shortly. Uh, for more on resilience, disaster, and climate, in addition to this report, which is on our website, uh, you should also check out a new podcast that we've launched at CPR. I I'm hosting it. It's called CPR's Connect the Dots, and you can find that podcast on CPR's main page of the website, progressivereform.org, in one of the sliding images that you'll see on that page. This report has been a long time coming, uh, as we've seen from all the devastation of Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, Maria, now Florence. And uh, though we're focusing on the U.S. today, I want you to keep some room in your hearts for the Indonesians recovering from the terrible tsunami that hit Sulawesi last week. Uh, in this report, CPR uh, has brought together really more than a dozen of the nation's top legal scholars to look at different aspects of disaster policy in the United States, with an emphasis in particular on social inequality. Uh, one of the best parts of this report, and our editors pressed us on this a lot, is there is an extensive list of policy solutions, concrete things that we think that policymakers can begin doing at the local, state, tribal, and national levels. It's a 100-page report, so it's big, but it's got lots of bite-sized chapters. They're short. They're readable. You can pick them out and see them out of order, uh, and they're on everything you might imagine. Federal resilience standards, FEMA response, flood insurance, state and local government planning, migration, uh, worker health and safety, hazardous substances, NEPA and, and environmental assessments, takings issues in eminent domain, which are, are driving cities crazy right now around the country, and, and tort lawsuits involving climate change. The, the big payoff is on pages two through six, just four pages, and they're titled, What Should Be Done? And that's where we kind of package up a lot of these recommendations, which we justify and discuss uh, more fully in the rest of the report. But just to give you an idea, right, before we get into this discussion, some of the things that we're recommending after lots of discussion on our own on this are, uh, we say that resilience, climate adaptation, and social equity initiatives have to be mainstreamed into everything uh, that's involved with local and state planning. We say that FEMA has to consider the resources uh, of the partners that it's working with so that poorer jurisdictions like Louisiana and Puerto Rico don't get the short end of the stick. We say that Congress needs to provide FEMA and the core proper resources so they can protect the nation's levees and the dams, and that the president needs to reinstate his predecessor's flood safety executive order, which is really a no-brainer. Uh, Congress needs to phase out federal subsidies for the NFIP, that is the flood insurance program, while providing premium support to low-income homeowners. Local governments need to increase their use of green infrastructure, uh, and the federal government needs to prod local governments to do that. We need to update our power grid, move from a centralized system to a more resilient decentralized system based on smart grid technology. OSHA needs new safety standards for workers uh, involved with heat stress and ergonomics and infectious diseases. Uh, EPA needs to require sites with permits for hazardous waste to develop emergency disaster plans. The White House uh, needs to make sure that environmental impact statements incorporate climate change analysis. And yeah, there are things we, we say the courts need to de do too. The courts, uh, I think it's safe to say, have made a mess of eminent domain law over the last uh, several decades, and cities uh, are pulling their hair out over that. Uh, we need the courts to figure out and organize eminent domain law so that jurisdictions know how they can use eminent domain to keep people from building in unsafe places. 
Uh, and there are things municipalities could do with their lawyers too, even with existing law. And the Supreme Court needs to clear, make a clear standard of preemption for sta state common law by federal common law, uh, which is really important in, in these disaster tort cases. So that's just you know, a smattering of what you're going to find in this report. And uh, we're going to focus today on a discussion involving state and local planning, on federal uh, response and FEMA, and also on migration and uh, relocation. These are the things that my guests were most interested in talking about. And now we're going to get to them. Uh, we, just, we have two, uh, both from outside CPR, uh, and uh, wonderful, wonderful discussions today. One is Joyce Coffey. She's the founder and president of Climate Resilience Consulting, which is a certified B Corp. Uh, over her career, Joyce has worked on projects for the U.S. government, for the World Bank. She's led development of the Chicago Climate Action Plan, which is when I first met her when she was working on that. Uh, with experience in private, public, and nonprofit sectors, Joyce knows resilience from just about any angle you could imagine. Bob Marshall is a Pulitzer Prize winning environmental journalist and a native New Orleanian. Uh, he's lived through and covered his share of harrowing events in Louisiana over the last 40 years, and those include hurricanes and oil spills and New Orleans Saints debacles. Uh, his <laughs> column in the, in the Times-Picayune uh, is, is there for everyone to read online. He unpacks climate change issues for Louisiana residents in terms uh, that they relate to and, and, and resonating with the values that they care about. That column, I got to say, is a must read anywhere in this country. I really recommend it. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is move to slide number four, if you can, Brian. Uh, it's the map there. This is just a, uh, an image that I found in a local uh, newspaper here in New Orleans, actually. It's the story, what we already know. In the last 10 years, states have really been through the ringer. They've lost tens of billions of dollars uh, in disaster impacts. Joyce, my question to get us started is that you work with local governments and, and uh, governments of various sizes around the country. Do you think that decision makers are, are getting the message about the amount of damage that they could reduce if they took into consideration things like scenario planning and green infrastructure and other things that are in our report? Is this message getting across? And, um, and if it is, in, in, in what ways is that happening? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks so much. And, you know, I was just absolutely thrilled to see your report come across my transom um, for one key reason, uh, that the legal beagles were asking questions about social equity. Because I think to answer your question directly, yes, local government officials are keenly aware of the risks that they not only face for the future, but that they're experiencing today that are different from the past. And they are, in fact, aware of some of the scenario analysis that shows what those climate risks will mean for their specific municipality. But that doesn't mean that they have all the tools in their, quiver, in their tool belt to uh, solve for not only these burgeoning risks, but also the current uh, crisis that they may be facing at home. <laughs> so, you know, the, the seemingly intractable problem of social inequity, for instance, in many of America's cities, combined with the burgeoning climate change risks that cities face, I think presents um, some pretty significant uh, hardship for both elected officials and civil servants um, who are managing and leading in this new era. And one thing I'll say about the slide that we're all looking at right now, vis-a-vis um, -vis natural disasters, is that this is something that I think the best elected officials really get not only are these damages in terms of costs, but they're also in terms of well-being. So the, the least um, able to uh, be resilient, that is the least resource communities in the United States, um, typically do have disproportionate risk from climate change impacts, but they may not in fact be experiencing the biggest cost-related losses. So that's something that I'm really glad that the report pointed out that it's not all about you know, insurance adjustments, that we're also talking about loss of livelihoods and loss of lower cost buildings that still provide very important functions for lower income people. Bob, I'm looking at uh, Louisiana on this 
map. And of course, uh, I mean, just to pick up on something that Joyce said, I mean, look at some of our poorer states, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, for instance. Uh, and, and these are some of the states that are having some of the largest, uh, experiencing some of the largest impacts from disaster. In, in, in following uh, the movements of politics here in Louisiana and, and New Orleans, are you seeing at the planning stage uh, any developments that, that give you some hope? Are there things that other parts of the country could be learning from in terms of what we're doing? And are there things that we still need to learn down here in the Gulf? Well, you know, there, there are actually, which is kind of a rare thing to say that Louisiana is a leader uh, in something on a positive side. That's um, why I asked it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, first let me also throw some kudos out for the report. I felt that it was uh, really the, the best encapsulation of what I see as really this big holistic change in an infrastructure we have to develop that we haven't really paid attention to as a nation and that is all the different challenges that are presented by climate change and that, you know, certainly coastal states, many other states are also facing now. And so, and the here's what must be done sections are perfect, and I would recommend it to anyone who covers these issues or who administers, who, you know, in policy making in any state, this would be a handy guide um, to list these things, uh, to look at what you're, you're facing. And there's so many different areas <laughs> that we have to adapt to that are being presented to us as challenges from, from climate change. But here in Louisiana, you know, we probably have, uh, believe it or not, since Katrina developed what is uh, maybe the nation's uh, most advanced science-based climate adaptation plan, and that's our coastal master plan. Um, it's a 50-year, $92 billion plan to save some of the bottom third of the state. Uh, but also, we've also engaged in some groundbreaking uh, resilience projects. Um, one is LA Safe, which maybe many people have heard of. It was a HUD grant. And what this, uh, this poor backward southern state has done is, has begun a program that it's really on the cutting edge of getting communities involved in determining what their future will be. One of the greatest achievements, in my opinion, in covering this is that it's actually gotten these people who live in danger to stop denying. Um, this is a problem with red states. Uh, that's been going on since climate change first became an issue. Um, for example, our congressional, our co congressional delegation, which has one Democrat and uh, five Republicans, uh, most of the Republicans consistently vote against any type of climate regulation. And in fact, Steve Scalise, who represents this corner of the state, the southeast corner, which has suffered the most land loss from uh, subsidence and now sea level rise. Uh, recently, he's one of the most outspoken critics of uh, climate change science as well as legislation, and recently co authored with a, a rep from West Virginia a resolution in the House to oppose any type of carbon tax. So, you know, we, we have this uh, residents here who continue to elect by large margins Republicans who were absolutely in opposition to regulations on emissions, and yet they live in the state that NOAA and NASA say uh, will face the greatest amount of sea level rise driven by emissions controls. In fact, the state's own scientists, the state's position on this is that without dramatic reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, this state will see lose 1,200 to 2,800 square miles, an additional 1,200 to 28 square miles of its coast uh, before 2067. You know, migration has already started. There's a huge energy infrastructure there. So there's this, this terrible paradox uh, where convincing the voters uh, that what they do at the polls, the type of people they send to Congress, uh, is really important uh, to their survival. And um, so it, there's a, a great sad paradox, this killing irony, really, of this state that has this great advanced science adaptation plan, is looking for funding, is making great progress in the engineering, and yet its political message to the nation is that we don't want to address the primary cause. So I think overall, if I can skip to a broader theme uh, that I think your report brings up and, and it kept coming to my mind as I read it, was that, you know, uh, at some point, uh, Americans 
have to look in the mirror and say, yes, this is a problem, and it's going to cost me money, and we need to do most of these things locally as well as nationally. Well, that's great. I, I want to ask you, Joyce, um, Bob mentioned some of the big hurdles that are in our national politics, and at the end he mentioned local change. Um, when, when you were working with uh, communities um, and, and local decision makers, what's the main barrier uh, for moving forward either on disaster resilience or climate resilience? Is it money? Is it uh, lack of scientific information? What, what is it? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think um, that's an excellent question. And first I'll say that, in fact, um, before even thinking about barriers, we might want to think about what is underway. Um, because cities yeah, okay, are incredibly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So cities are incredibly resilient places. And, you know, when we get fresh water from our tap that is um, potable and when we don't have to deal with our waste, it just disappears, we can be thankful that there's resilience built into the city systems. Um, and in fact, that in spite of what we just heard is um, a real failure of leadership perhaps at different levels of government, most local governments know enough to act on climate science. So in, in the, your report, for instance, you talk about the critical features of planning, including that there's you know, ongoing monitoring and reevaluation of strategies, absolutely. And cities have the resilience business. They've been in this business for a long time, so they even have historical data to show where they need to be um, acting with more urgency. And I think there are three things that really put leading cities ahead of others in terms of this urgency. One yeah, is that is um, within the management structure, uh, the utility leaders, the elected officials, the, uh, the mayor and the city council, not just the mayor, um, and you know, the, the commissioners for the key departments all understand that mitigating future risk is a part of their success. Um, so that's really crucial. And you see that happening in places like Miami Beach, for instance, versus other communities in the south southern Florida area, where Miami Beach has an incredible army of senior leadership that is putting the climate science first and these um, proactive hazard mitigations first. So that's number one. Number two, Cities need to be given tools um, or access tools themselves that show what the collateral benefits are for acting today to mitigate future risk. Because there is even, I mean, especially in the private sector, no one really acts beyond the quarter, three months, not to mention three years or 30 years, um, which is the you know, time frame within which cities have to make decisions. So giving them the agency to show value um, of current actions mitigating hazards that will improve things for today, which again the report calls out, we need to talk about these collateral benefits today, while also mitigating future risks is crucial. And there are, you know, I think really important um, tools for that, even the easy ones like the National Institute of Building Safety coming out with their um, hazard mitigation data that show for every dollar invested in mitigation, risk mitigation. Today, you save either between $6 and $7 in the future. So that's a, a real investment that I think um, a lot of politicians can get behind and then other civil servants. But the other thing that I think is crucial um, has to do with what you call out in your report, and that is having the right regulatory structure in place. And this is tough, um, and you spell out some of how tough it is, but it's especially tough for the vast majority of cities in the United States that fit into that medium-sized or small city territory. So one thing I will just remind us is that two-thirds of Americans live in cities that are under 75,000 people. And we don't really think about that very often until we ask ourselves, well, where did I come from or where did my parents come from? <laughs> small towns. And these small towns don't actually have the wherewithal to put in place fancy regs. So I really think that one additional feature that could be um, culled from these excellent recommendations in this report is that the International Code Council, on which so many codes rest um, around the United States, be um, forced uh, through the advocacy community to make much more state strong statements in the basic codes around including climate risk. Um, and one other thing I'll say, which is adding to my list of three, is that you know, part of what we see in many cities is that um, now I'm pivoting to the question of equity, there is an understanding of the need to 
better address physical um, vulnerabilities for the socially marginalized, to use the word from the port. And then it speaks out the elderly, disabled, and poor. But the thing that's super crucial is that cities then are also compelled to act on the information that they have about that disproportionate risk. Because um, decision making in cities is like decision making everywhere. It's based upon biggest value. And since value is tending to be driven by dollars, it does not necessarily mean that even when a city knows where its heat map is for those with um, lower resources, and it sees that that heat map is similar to the morbidity and mortality map showing after an extreme heat event, and same as the uh, basement flooding um, during extreme precipitation events, even when all of those data are presented, a city may still choose to, for instance, put their public health clinics in areas that have uh, more density, or perhaps to improve their uh, water infrastructure in areas where they're going to see um, uh, fewer homes flooded, but more, fewer of those homes, especially that are higher income. So I think it just, it's important that we not only speak about planning and being aware of, but actually implementing policies that have um, that undo the disproportionate risk that you know is endemic um, to many cities. Yeah, I mean that's a really good point, and in some cases you have to, you know, speaking as a lawyer here, you have to hardwire that sometimes into the laws so that mm -hmm. uh, decision makers have to think about those things as they go forward. If, if listeners are interested in a really neat map um, on social vulnerability, the CDC puts out an interactive map uh, that you, you can go down to your, uh, you can go down to the, 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 the census uh, tracks and take a look at social vulnerability to disasters in anywhere in the country. If you just Google CDC and, and um, social vulnerability, you'll see this map. And it's, it's designed for local, uh, for local decision makers. I want to move up to slide five, Brian. And, and uh, Bob, I'm going to hit you with this question. Uh, because I, I, you know, I know that you've seen uh, your share of theme and response uh, in, in so many ways. And, and my question is, in our report, we actually do some really interesting digging, and we have some charts in there that others might be interested in, showing uh, the, the huge discrepancy between the response and recovery resources deployed after Harvey in Texas and uh, and the, the relatively smaller compared to the damage resources uh, devoted to Maria after Puerto Rico where thousands of people died. Um, FEMA was, of course, criticized after Katrina for, for not uh, you know, doing enough early enough for us. And, and I'm wondering in your reporting, Bob, um, is, uh, do you think that, uh, that this uh, – why is this happening it, 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 still? I mean, why is FEMA still seem to be caught on its heels? Is it because, you know, it's hard to deal after the third event that, that, that's happened in a small period of time, or is there something more going on? Well, it's a good question with a complicated answer, I believe. Um, FEMA had been hollowed out. Um, the FEMA that was built up during the Clinton administration and got rave, pretty much rave reviews was hollowed out uh, in the first half of the George W. Bush years. And of course, not only was it, they, uh, many Republicans in Congress considered it kind of a handout to, you know, whatever, people who were poor, didn't care, or just were handouts to people who should be doing this on their own. You remember the head of, of, of FEMA was a guy whose previous uh, position or professional experience was, was the head of the American Arabian Horse Association. Um, so uh, they were not prepared, uh, even if you want to give them, you know, some, I don't know, a mulligan for saying no one was really prepared for Katrina. It was much worse than most people even here thought it would be. They, the response uh, was slow and, and disjointed, um, but it wasn't just FEMA. It was, an, you know, the original response by the National Guard and many other organizations. After that, I think, um, you know, uh, FEMA was rebuilt. Um, but then um, I think it got fairly good reviews during the Obama years. But, you know, on the eve of, of Harvey, I think um, Congress is getting ready to cut almost a billion dollars out of the budget for FEMA. So I, I think it's a sense of national priority. I also think, 
and I'm just basing it on what I read because I didn't go there to cover anything. I'm just the press reports I've been reading. But, you know, unfortunately, Puerto Rico, although it is part of this country, uh, is not considered really by many people uh, to be part of the country, their neighbors, people they care about, certainly doesn't have a lot of sway in Congress. So I think that was part of the problem and, once again, part of uh, an administration's, uh, you know, uh, philosophy or outlook on what it should do. Um, I, I think um, I thought after FEMA, and I still feel going forward in this age of climate change where we are having these enormous events. People think of hurricanes, but the worst flooding events really have been from uh, from uh, storms, from rainstorms. Here in Louisiana, we had a 1,000-year rain what, three years ago. A year before that, we had a 500-year rain just north of New Orleans. And really, uh, the damage in Houston in Texas from that hurricane wasn't really from wind. It was from the storm stalled and you had all this rain and the storm water flooding, not, uh, not storm surge. Um, so as I read uh, what's going on in Congress, the funding for different agencies, but more, uh, even more than that, this the general uh, idea of what's happening in the country, um, I think people are missing in general uh, what climatologists have been warning for 10 or 15 years is that these um, – these record events uh, will be more common, and they have been more common. Um, we've had record rain events all over the country. We've had record wildfires. We're having record heat waves. We're having record floods. Uh, Mississippi River's had its two highest flows in, ever in the last five or six years and two of its lowest rivers. So these things are happening, which comes back to your, your report and planning for disaster. Maybe it should be... You know, in the age of climate change, that's really what we need to be doing. So I think FEMA, if uh, to get back to your specifically to answer your question, if if that hurricane had hit uh, New York, New Jersey, Montana, <laughs> or uh, or Texas, I think the response would have been a lot quicker. And it wasn't just because uh, it was an island. I just think that that's uh, unfortunately. Uh, the way we, we we view most of our um, parts of the country that aren't states, I think you know Guam, several, several other places. So, but I think FEMA certainly um, improved after Katrina, learned a lot of lessons. There were a lot of reports, but I think we have to keep an eye on it every year, and and make sure that it's funded and that the people who are running it are the best we can find. That's one of the issues, right, is, is we need a dedicated funding stream for so many of these things as opposed to something ad hoc that, that depends well, on politics or, or whatever. That's, that's what I was getting at originally with the yeah. whole idea of infrastructure. We're think, when we think of in, infrastructure in this country, and everyone's been saying we need to repair America's infrastructure, we normally think of roads and bridges, maybe dams and levees, but there's this – this other infrastructure to responding to disaster that we really haven't developed, not just responding, more importantly, as your report points out, preventing it, you know, mitigation beforehand, pre-disaster mitigation, preparing for what we should see. It's obviously happening, and it's going to come to a community near you eventually. And um, as, you know, one of the themes in your report uh, is, you know, a pound of um, an ounce of cure, it's worth a pound of prevention, and, and that's really um, what people should be waking up to. Um, and as Joyce said, you know, telling people this, this return on the dollar, almost seven bucks to a dollar of prevention, and I think that's really the key to achieving a lot of this um, uh, expensive work to prevent disaster. Uh, you know, everyone knows that this country, we we, we tend to legislate after disaster. We, we're, we've always been a wealthy country, and we don't take that ounce of prevention. We just throw billions uh, on on the problem after it happens, but we can't really afford to do that anymore. Bob, and, Bob I want to um, stop you there because I want to put I want to put you both on the spot in a second mm -hmm. here. And Brian, if you move that slide to six, um, because one of the uh, <laughs> hardest things to do, right, which, which might make some kind of financial sense, is what we call managed retreat. And I know that you both want to, we, we're going to open this up to questions very soon, but I wanted to 
Uh, I wanted, wanted to show you a picture I took. That's a picture I took out of an airplane. It wasn't part of the New York Times story. Uh, but as uh, Bob knows, that's Ile de Jean Charles. That's an area where we have another HUD grant in Louisiana that is helping to relocate uh, the Biloxi Chittimacha Choctaw uh, community that is living there. Uh, earlier, CPR uh, did another report uh, where we, where we uh, talked about at least uh, there were 10 or 12 communities in the United States that are all actively seeking to relocate en masse because of climate change. Most of those are, are uh, Native American villages in Alaska. But I wanted to ask you, um, Joyce, about this because uh, – it is inevitable, as hard as the conversation is, it's going to be inevitable that we have to talk in some cases about certain neighborhoods or maybe whole communities moving. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering in your work I advising uh, communities or others, how do you approach a conversation like that and how do you know when the tipping point is, right? That is when it's, yeah. you're better off spending the money to leave than to make things safer. Yeah, I, I want to um, address that question, but I also just want to pony um, on to um, what we were just cheering about, the federal government, sure, with something ahead. that I think sure. we have perhaps um, missed a little bit in the fray of, of news, and that is that in the spending bill that was signed in the spring, um, there is much more money for pre-disaster mitigation than there has ever been. Um, in fact, $249 million went to FEMA for that pre-disaster mitigation, which is three times the average annual amount over the past 15 years. And the um, CDDGR, the uh, Community Development Block Grant for Disaster Response, which is a HUD program, got an additional $16 billion to support what they call mitigation act er activities. So that's um, mitigation and described by HUD, in this administration anyway, as actions taken to protect communities from the predictable damage from future events. So I, I want to get to the point of, of relocation Good. in a moment, yeah. but it's sure. important for us to find these funds where we can. And just like the Sandy Reconstruction Act, which I agree with Bob, you know, those are the sorts of things that happen for rich and powerful Congress people, <laughs> not for our poorest states. But that was really, um, to date, our largest climate bill ever passed through Congress, and the word climate change never appeared anywhere. So as advocates and practitioners and um, legal folk, I think we owe it to ourselves to be looking for and helping to create additional funding streams, um, for instance, even when they don't use the words that we would like them to. Um, because in the really end, what point. we're looking to do is to save lives and improve livelihoods regardless of, you know, whether that's done um, in keeping with our values of, of climate science. But from the perspective of relocation, um, you know, I was super impressed that this report took that on because it is incredibly um, fraught. And uh, to, to echo something that Bob said earlier, Louisiana should be commended for the courageous work they have done to relocate and even just to talk about relocation. Of course, some of the relocation that's happened in Louisiana has been chaotic and completely unplanned and not at all charming. And I think all of it has come with a lot of tragedy because who, who does want to leave their home, whether it's the first year they've lived there or the fourth generation they've lived there. Um, but one thing that your report does say, which I think we should worry about a little bit, is that um, it, it suggests that local officials should advocate for uh, relocation. And I don't think that's the word. I think that no one uh -huh. will ever win an election on advocating for relocation because it is, in fact, so painful. Um, on the other hand, I think that relocation needs to be part of planning and that when we, if we talk about relocation from the perspective of preserving communities, um, and doing so in a way that means it's not a chaotic retreat, but actually a planned um, change, uh, we will likely have slightly better success, learning again from communities that have already had to go in this, you know, really hard direction, especially in Louisiana, but other communities too. And on Louisiana point, I just wanted to mention one um, anecdote. I was on American Airlines uh, last week coming back from Climate Week, New York, and there's a supplement in American Airlines. Um, it's about 30 pages, actually, that Louisiana put in there talking about how great the state is for economic development. And um, on page three, there's this gorgeous, glossy photo of this water campus that Louisiana State University is featuring. And the president of, this, of the university is quoted 
as speaking about needing to be leaders in terms of coastal protection, including relocation. And I just thought that was profound, really mm. important, and something we need to continue to think about and do more of. We are here advocating for Louisiana's economic development, he says, and part of that is being planful around the relocation. And he's a really important leader saying that. So here's to Louisiana. But just to end my comments on your initial question, what it takes to avoid relocation, to be on the adapt and prepare part of the trifecta, adapt, prepare, and relocate, is a lot of money. So, you know, New York, City of New York, can perhaps talk more about people staying in lower Manhattan because they're going to build them this gorgeous big U. Uh, the city of Miami Beach is already elevating streets and pumping like crazy and putting in all this hard infrastructure to allow for people to actually rise above, not even get wet, but rise above. That's their logo mark and tagline. Wow. One of the reasons why each of these places can do this is because they have extraordinary wealth in their tax base and in their ratepayer base. And in fact, Miami Beach was able to double their sewer rate after putting in the sewer rate um, the first time in 2009. They didn't even have one before that time. And then in 2014, doubling it, seemingly without angst. Like, there, isn't, there isn't even news of people complaining about that. Um, most communities will not be able to do that. And so those communities that do not have the tax base, I think, are in for planning for, not necessarily advocating for, and then moving forward with um, reloc relocation that preserves communities. Okay, okay. I think it might be a good time to open it up uh, for questions. Brian, you want to um, move the next slide with the big question mark? Um, and I, I don't know, Brian, it, does it make sense for you to, to um, manage the questions coming in or maybe to toss one out to us? Sure, I can do that. Um, I want to ask the chairperson um, if she'd like to unmute all the lines because there is a participant who wants to add on to the federal issue that Joyce was just talking about. The conference has been unmuted. Thank you. Um, Whitford, would you like to go ahead and ask your question or, or make your supplementary point about the federal issue? Uh, sure. Th thanks for having me. I hope the audio is working here. I just couldn't help um, add on to some of the, the federal legislation that Joyce pointed out. Um, uh, yesterday, Congress actually passed probably one of the, 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 the more major hazard mitigation uh, supplemental pieces of legislation that we've seen in, in decades uh, through the Disaster Recovery and Reform Act. And a part of the Disaster Recovery and Reform Act actually authorizes the president to set aside 6% of the total disaster appropriation spent in any given year through the DRF and put that towards pre-disaster mitigation. So as, as Joyce uh, said, in any given year, uh, you know, usually 30 to $40 million are put into pre-disaster mitigation. Now, 6% of the total uh, recovery funds that are spent in any year will be put towards disaster mitigation. That, that could be hundreds of millions, if not a billion dollars. Um, you know, as the legislation worked through Congress, it, 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 it was changed a little bit at first. It mandated the president to put aside that 6%. Now it said he, he may, but um, that's the wind up. He, you know, here's the pitch. That, that's an off budget issue that, that somehow squeaked its way through the, the financial um, uh, uh, overseers on, on the Hill. H how do you, how do you, you know, force or entice a president to actually fulfill that responsibility and put those off budget funds in a pre disaster mitigation account? Well, uh, this is Bob Marshall. I have a, couple, a question and then maybe an answer to your, to your question. Um, and that is, uh, Joyce may know this too, but how much of the pre-disaster mitigation uh, funding goes unclaimed each year, goes unspent, un, ungranted? Uh, from my understanding, it's a, it's a super competitive program. Um, that doesn't mean I, I don't have that answer, but I – my understanding was that, 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 that it's a competitive program, and, and therefore I thought that, that all, all the funds were spent every year, but, but perhaps it's something we could look at. Okay, well then, because I had, in a, a story I had uh, reported a, a couple of years ago on the uh, disaster mitigation grants, uh, 
and some of the pre-disaster things when that came along was that a lot of it is never used. In other words, states are, uh, are approved for a certain amount of their plants, but then it's never used. Anyway, uh, uh, to your question, uh, the way you get a president to do that is to have enough of the uh, Congress and his party uh, to lean on him to do it, uh, basically. And I think, I think it is a good sign uh, uh, that um, this is in the bill, obviously con a bipartisan effort, but supported by Republicans who typically have a tighter wallet uh, than Democrats on these issues. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, uh, going back to it, something that Joyce talked about earlier, too, I, one of my Google alerts is sea level rise. And uh, every day, almost every, almost every community in red states are looking or having meetings on sea level rise, looking for adaptation, looking for grants. So the word is spreading, and, and this will obviously help them. This is maybe in response to that growing interest, because whether they want to use climate change, climate science, volcanoes, it doesn't matter. They are uh, past the age of denial and acknowledging that they do see this problem and they want help. I want to give a shout out to Whit Remmer, who asked that question. He's a former student of mine, so yeah. happy to have you on the call. <laughs> Thanks for your um, are, there, yeah. are, are there other questions? So, well, this is Joyce, and maybe I could just add yeah, something ahead, um, more to this yeah. question about funding, because I think we fall a little bit into the rabbit hole when we get into speaking about these giant sums coming from the federal government, um, because, I mean, I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer, but it's never going to be enough, ever, for what we have ahead of us. It hasn't been enough for what we had behind us. Many right. individuals, homeowners, small business owners, even large business owners, end up holding the bag in the disaster. And so I guess I, I want to come back to two things. One, this question about what money is left on the table. First of all, we need to also remind ourselves that state funds, some of which come from the feds, but like state revolving loan funds, WIFIA, TIFIA, those are great sources of funding for communities to um, pile on on resilience. And one of the major, you know, you said in the beginning of your presentation, uh, pages two through six had all the news that fit to print on this report. And one of the things it said was that we need to be including the um, you know, disaster mitigation in regulation, I really think that things like the state revolving loan funds um, should right. include requirements for disaster risk prevention and increasing resilience as part of what's required in order to get those monies. And number two, um, although I'm very focused on social equity, I do think that cities need to put as a major priority continuing to shore up their tax base because in the end it is cities and the ability for them to generate jobs um, and keep, you know, their services running uh, and service delivery sound, both social services and physical infrastructure, that will allow for communities to be healthy enough to come back. Um, and so that's another piece of, I think, really important city leadership, like constantly looking for ways to make fair rate increases um, to be sure they are, you know, uh, basically feathering their nest for the future risks. And then lastly, something that you did put in the report, but I, I want to put a finer point on, and that is that land use law is local. And it is everything from the perspective of the risks that we're talking about on this call, right? The riverine risk, flooding risks, the coastal risk, the wildfire, the drought. Um, land use has an answer to all of those risks. And uh, so we need to be looking ahead, and it's politically very difficult, but perhaps using the next major event, uh, putting in place a law that says the next time you know, we have a taking um, from this event, we have to see this community leave. And we're making plans right now to create a utopia for that community. Um, that, to me, is, I think, a real answer to, even though these big funds are swirling around at the federal level, what happens um, when the rubber meets the road you know, in your neighborhood. Yeah, that's a, uh, those are really good points. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. I was just going to throw another uh, bouquet out to my home state here. Uh, as Joyce said about, event, you know, if we're waiting for the federal government to save us with money, we're never going to get enough money uh, because there are too many states and communities looking for to participate. But also here at one of the coastal parishes, most hard, uh, worst hit by subsidence, land erosion, sea level rise, Terrebonne Parish, which is where the other St. Charles is, um, they've been fighting for a, a certain 
storm surge protection levy for about 30 years. It's, the money's never come. Uh, and so they have increased their own property taxes. They're basically paying their own way uh, to a large extent for a lot of the mitigation, uh, pre-disaster mitigation uh, they're doing, raising levies and flood walls. Uh, it's not a poor parish. There are a lot of poor people there, Native Americans in particular, but it's an oil, uh, it's kind of a depot for the oil industry. So, but they're moving forward, and I think Joyce is right, and that's what I alluded to earlier. Eventually, uh, people in this country who hate the thought of paying taxes for any reason, um, you know, have to look in the mirror and say, look, I, I'm, I'm going to have to pay more now so that I don't get ruined later on. And this is coming, and it's been happening all over the country. And um, adaptation. You know, if you can get into regulations, if you can, you know, we're trying to, we're talking about regulations when we have a president who's rolling them all back, who, you know, the flood safety executive order that, you know, uh, dealing with climate change and, you know, that that uh, Obama's uh, flood safety order that uh, one of the first things President Trump did was to cancel that. So, yeah, that's all important. It's got to work together, and I don't know if it will happen unless – Enough to understand just how it is to their bottom line, their wallet. I, w- I want to call. I think that's a really good point, Bob. And I just Joanne Brown, Joanna Brown has, has has made a point on our chat list that I just think is really important too. She talks about uh, she's happy about hazard mitigation funds, but says that uh, we also need help with public health, business continuity, agriculture, and these, as she says, softer issues. And, and this goes really to this social vulnerability point that we were trying to make in this report, is that if you think of community hazard, it, one part of it is the physical vulnerability of the geography and so on, and then the other part is the social vulnerability. And there have been some wonderful uh, you know, social scientists who've looked at the mapping on this demographically, and it, it surprises people to learn that in southern Louisiana, for instance, the thing that sets us most apart from the rest of the country is not our geographic vulnerability. It is our social vulnerability. And uh, if you could fix that or address that, you could probably save a lot more money uh, in some cases than building seawalls. And, uh, and, and so, I, you know, that is a, I think that is a nut that's really hard to crack, but the social safety net in uh, certain parts of the country, namely the Gulf South, is much lower than it is in other parts of the country. And yet we still have, uh, you know, we're hurricane territory too. So all of these things kind of add up. I don't mean to make this just about the Gulf, but I think that's important to kind of take a look at whatever your vulnerabilities are and wherever you're living, because you probably have similar issues, particularly in the rural areas of the Rockies where you've got all the fires and drought and things like that. Um, is, there a, is there another question or a comment that someone would like to make? Uh, this is this is weird. If, if I can just make w- one more comment, um, as as Joyce was saying, I think a lot of these kind of become state and, and local issues. And and one more thing that um that this legislation uh, did yesterday was for the first time require um, as a, as an eligibility factor mm-hmm. for pre disaster mitigation grants and now hazard mitigation um, grants after the fact that states have adopted a, a statewide building code. Several states don't even have statewide model building codes. So we are seeing some pressure from DC for states to, to, to adopt building codes and enforce them. Uh, and of course they can, they can amend them to, to, their, to their liking in their particular settings, but some states don't even have model building codes, which is, which is an issue. And, and that's a, another positive step. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and as Joyce points out, there are a lot of communities, small ones, that don't even have their own staff uh, to write things like hazard mitigation plans or building codes and things, and they they outsource that to private uh, consulting companies, uh, which uh, which if you could you know get to sort of what they what those companies do and how they create their plans, you could have a lot of leverage. Uh, when I was at the EPA back in the Obama administration, we tried to work uh, with some of those private consultants in small towns so that we could try to build a kind of a cookie cutter hazard mitigation plan that took into consideration climate change, for instance. Um, mm-hmm. So there are, there are things that the private sector can do too. 
I could just also add on to um, the question and comment, really, from uh, the expert on the line who pointed out public health, agriculture, some of these softer issues. And this is really, you know, something that's as old as the art of persuasion itself, so thousands of years old. But we certainly know, those of us who've made our, cli our, our claim um, professionally around, you know, sustainability and climate change, that there is a much bigger audience if we say, gosh, this is actually a public health issue. How can I help you, public health leaders? Yes. You know, it's going to get harder, and we would love to be part of what you're doing or to ag or whoever those other people. And you know what? I Frankly, they're ready. They, they're leading on this too. Um, and so I think there's really a desire and need for these fields, perhaps through the bridge of legal questions, to come together a little bit more. Um, and, and I guess the other thing I would say is I always look at the word mainstreaming, which is in your report, and I think, yes, yeah. that's as a practitioner what we do. We mainstream. It's very important to mainstream. You know, have all departments walking in lockstep around the climate science, for instance. I mentioned that earlier. But when we actually think about what faces us, the seemingly intractable problem of social inequity and the seemingly intractable problem of climate change risk, mainstreaming is not going to work. It's not enough. Mainstreaming got us where we are today, which is a lot of inequity. Um, I know poverty is re reducing around the world, but let's just talk about American cities for a moment. Um, I'm sitting in Chicago where the inequities have grown, and there are really damning numbers even, quantification to show that. Um, so when I think about this, it's more than mainstreaming. To me, it's transformation, and I just really encourage all of us to put this social equity question at the forefront of our work it's very hard for someone like me in sustainability to know what to do around social equity, but I'm going to figure that out as I keep working, because if we don't, we will make both so much worse. I think that is an excellent point, perhaps, to, to go out on. Um, I want to make sure that I respect everybody's time, and, and uh, I, I want to thank uh, Joyce Coffey, and I want to thank uh, Bob Marshall for being just terrific discussions today. It's, you're, you're, you're both just, uh, you know so much, and it was just so interesting to hear from you both. And, and thanks uh, for all of you who participated online, either by listening or by writing in our questions. Visit our website often, read our report, check out the podcast, uh, and uh, email us back and let us know uh, what you'd like to hear in the future and, and how we did today. Uh, thanks very much. I'm going to turn it over to to Brian and, and Catherine if there are any outgoing housekeeping messages that we have. Thank you, Rob. Uh, the only thing I'd like to add is that as you exit the uh, webinar today, uh, there should be a short survey, and we just encourage you uh, to offer your brief feedback on that. It should take no more than two or three minutes to complete. Uh, that concludes today's webinar. Thank you, Joyce and Bob and Rob, uh, and thank you, everybody, for attending today. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.